Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our March edition of uh, Tiger Talks. Um, and uh, this afternoon, we've got a pretty good one. Rich is, Rydis is going to talk to us about the art collection that he and Lois uh, donated to the University Art M Museum. And, and you know what? I haven't heard, I, I've seen the preview of this, and I haven't heard such a good art lecture since um, Art 101 in 62 with Sonnenfeld, if any of you guys remember that. And um, next, he's going to talk about his Krispy Kreme donut adventures. Um, this part of the talk, frankly, is interesting, but it has a lot of holes. Excuse me. I'm, I, sorry, I couldn't pass, pass that up. It's probably a good time for me to stop talking, but um, before I hand the mic over to, um, to Gib Henschke to introduce Rich, I want to say a couple things about our 66 community. Uh, several weeks ago, we had a great alumni dinner. Uh, we Zoomed it. For those of you who didn't see that or couldn't, couldn't have been there, we had about 80 in attendance. In addition to Rocky Barrett, who a lot of us hadn't seen for a long time, Rocky's tribal chairman of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation in Oklahoma, and he received his locomotive uh, award there. He gave a fascinating talk. And in addition to him, we had 16 recipients of uh, class and classmate scholarships there and Princeton Prize uh, winners, undergraduates as our guests. And I'll tell you what, they were a very diverse group from all over the world. They're accomplishing a lot of different things. And almost all of them had an online presence that describes what they were doing to the entire world. It's so different than we were in school. Um, I, I remember I tried to keep everything I was doing from my parents, let alone the rest of the world. Um, anyway, it was really interesting getting to know them. And, and next year, I hope more of you can make it to the, to the alumni dinner. Uh, our times together are getting uh, more precious as we get older. Uh, our next opportunity uh, to get together is going to be in May, May 25th to be exact. We're going to have our 58th reunion dinner at the uh, Terhune Orchards. And we got a great evening planned there, so I hope you can make it. Um, you know, uh, if we can't be physically together, we are still all getting older together. And, and this year is a milestone for a lot of us as we turn 80. And I just want to take a moment to, to urge you to take time to keep in touch, to Zoom, uh, to email with classmates and friends. Uh, we've got John Holman who writes a personal birthday note to every one of us, and, and no other class has that. He's amazing. But an email or a call or a birthday note from one of us to a classmate or a friend could brighten someone's day or uh, assist someone who's having a problem. Small things like that keep our class together, keep our class community together. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Gib. Uh, thank you so much. Hello, classmates and guests. Now let me turn to the introduction of our featured speaker, Rich Linus. <clears throat> Rich was born in New York and moved to Southern California in 1955. He came to Princeton from Beverly Hills High School, along with classmates Nico Bostrup, who's here today, and the late Bruce Vanda. Rich majored in history and played football. In 1965, he was voted first team all Ivy League football. Rich also worked part-time in school while in school. In this case, he was a furniture mover, a third grade teacher, and worked at reunions. After Princeton, Rich returned home and earned his JD at the University of Southern California. He started his legal career at the firm known today as Munger, Tolles and Olson, and then served as general counsel for several companies before starting his own firm, where he served for 20 years. During that period, Rich developed several businesses and in 1998, brought Krispy Kreme to Southern California. Thank you, Rich, for that. Rich's business became the largest Krispy Kreme franchise in the company system and at its peak, it operated 31 stores and served 800 grocery stores and employed 1,400 people. 
In 2004, the business stumbled and Rich worked to keep it going through a chapter 11. That story, including a dramatic recovery, will be part of today's talk by Rich. He returned to private law practice in 2006, and in 2014, he earned his current firm, he joined his current firm as a litigation partner. Rich is also a civic leader and serves on the board of numerous organizations, including among many others, the Match H. Gluck Foundation, the University of California Riverside Foundation, and the California State Bar Foundation. Rich is also a family man, and boy is he. He has been married to his wife, Lois, for just about 60 years. That's right, 60 years. Together, they've raised five wonderful children and have 15 grandkids. Over their many years together, Rich and Lois have collected art, and in 2023, they made a substantial gift of their art to Princeton University's Art Museum. That stunning collection of early 20th century American prints will be the other major piece of Rich's Tiger Talk today. Finally, Rich plans to remain very active. Two weeks ago, he was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom to serve on, on the California Fast Food Council which is the state's watchdog over wages and working conditions for fast food restaurant employees. Watch for Rich's impact on this issue going forward. And now I'd like to turn the spotlight over to our esteemed classmate, Rich Rhinus. Rich, ball to you. Thanks, Gib. I appreciate that. We'll get to the screen share in a second. Uh, just a few preliminary notes. First, to thank you to you and Steve, and especially to John Holman, who uh, pushed me through the door and onto this platform. I think thanks are in order, but we'll see when I get finished. The second thing is a bit of an apology to Lois, my wife, for 60 years, as of June 14th, uh, because something in the, um, the invitation you were all sent seemed to send a negative message of her not uh, being willing to exhibit these art uh, works in our home. I would never cast her in a negative light. Darlin, I love you and I apologize uh, profusely. Third uh, preliminary note is one for all of you. And that is you're about to see some 40 to 50 different impressions uh, from the collection we've donated to the university. It would really be terrific for me and the feedback uh, from you uh, if you would make note of any of the artworks I'm about to show you that somehow provoke you, that somehow give you reason to look more closely. Um, that would really be fulfilling for me. And I want to make this interactive, if at all possible. So I'll try to give you the slide number. You, you'll, you're going to hear the names of the artists and the works. If something really piques your interest, make note of it, put it in the chat room. I'd love to chat with you maybe after this is over about any particular piece that you see. Okay, so those are three preliminary notes uh, and a disclaimer, I'm not an expert by any means. I didn't take Sonnenfeld's class uh, or, or Art 101 really, and I'm not a fine arts major. Everything that I know about art, I guess I, I learned from my wife who is a fine arts major and graduated with a degree in fine arts and taught me a lot about art, but it's far from being an expert. You're not going to leave the, the, the bit of this talk about our art collection uh, terribly edified about how the difference between a lithograph and aqua tint and engraving and etching uh, a dry point or a, uh, a woodcut. Uh, but I'll do my best to try to distinguish them uh, when I can. Uh, otherwise, you'll hear me refer to these as impressions. So without further ado, uh, and those introductory remarks, uh, we're gonna go to screen share and uh, bear with me while I do this. I have an assistant to help me. And that one. Uh, this first slide's a teaser. I uh, put this together to hook you. Uh, I, I'm not ashamed to admit it. So I'll take you through the first four impressions. The first one uh, is by John Taylor Arms. It's West 42nd Street. These are all done in or about the 30s. Um, arms I chose uh, for this introduction because in 1887, he was an undergraduate at Princeton. 
Uh, he studied law, and I'm sure that a couple of guys who are on this Zoom remember him. Uh, he didn't graduate from Princeton. Um, uh, he went on to MIT, where many years later he graduated with a degree in architecture. And you can see in this work uh, the architectural influence. In this collection, there are certain things that for, that resonated with me. Architecture is one of them, and I'm going to talk about that later on. But that's why I chose this piece to kind of introduce you to that theme. The second reason I chose it was because on the corner of uh, 42nd Street and 8th Avenue in 1980 and 81, the city of and uh, state of New York wanted to redevelop 42nd Street for good reason. Uh, and they put out an RFP for, among other things, at that corner at 8th Avenue and uh, 42nd Street, uh, request for proposals from a team, from teams around the country to develop a 3 million square foot merchandise mart. I led that team that was selected. Merlini came down from the Berkshires to be there when Ed Koch awarded us uh, the right to develop uh, that location. Uh, it never happened, obviously. It's not there now. Uh, and never will be. Uh, but in the course of that, uh, I had a lot of fun and got a chance to meet Michael Graves and Helmut Jan, two wonderful architects. Graves, I think, has passed away. Uh, but he gave me a lot of time and talked to me about a building in Portland uh, that he had designed, which actually did get built. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about that later. The second piece is a Donald Vogel piece. Uh, Vogel's printed it here on beige paper. This is a second theme of the collection that was important to me in the sense that Vogel is showing you in the midst of the depression, basic infrastructure work that still must go on. And while the machinery and equipment is huge, the humans shown here are small. They're not ant-like in the sense of their size, but ant-like in the sense that they produce the work. And one of the things that I learned, I've learned in a long career, is the importance of people like those little figures there. Uh, Vogel was known for his portrayal of gritty blue uh, uh, collar workers. And while you can't see the collars here, you get the idea. Another uh, hobby of mine is boxing. I box on Fridays against inanimate objects. I don't like to hit things that might hit me back. Uh, and this is by an extremely uh, well-known artist by the name of George Bellows. Bellows graduated from Ohio State, died very young uh, in the late 20s of a ruptured appendix. Uh, but when he graduated from Ohio State, he had illustrated their annual, their yearbook. And uh, most folks who graduated with him thought he'd be a professional athlete. Uh, instead of being an athlete, he uh, painted athletics and in particular boxing, which he loved a lot. I'm gonna take you through this one in a greater detail than most of the other works because I want you to get an understanding of what this stuff meant to me, why it resonated with me, besides my interest in boxing. If you look at what Bellows has done here, and this piece is called Introducing John L. Sullivan, a very famous boxer uh, in, in the early part of the 20th century, he's made Sullivan a secondary character. Sullivan's being attended to by uh, two folks, and I want you to keep this image in mind. One of them looks like he's giving him a manicure. The other is giving him some coaching on uh, strategic uh, approaches to the bout that's upcoming. And the Michael Buffer type character in the center is announcing, uh, introducing Sullivan. And the light on his hand uh, draws your eye, but not so much as the forehead of the walrus mustached uh, obviously well-heeled guy behind the announcer. And that fellow seems to have a greater interest in the outcome of the fight than who's a winner and who's a loser. Uh, he's apparently got a financial interest. And if you were to cross him in any way, the bullet head guy on his right, our left, would take care of you, either that guy or the Peter Lorre character in the Penguin outfit on the far left. So what has Bellows done for me in this and why did I love this piece of work besides boxing? It is because I create the narrative. That's up to me. I can't get into Bellows' mind. I don't have any docent telling me what he was thinking. I provided the software programming for this image. Our kids don't do that, but and our grandchildren are in front of screens all the time and they tell the story for them. But to me, this is provocative. It's causing me to have to use my imagination, and that's what hooked me on it. 
The next piece on the lower left is the incredible James Allen's piece called The Aqueduct. And here there's no bones about it. It's not like Vogel where uh, the humans are reduced to ant size. Here the humans are glorified. These are people bringing water to us in the midst of the depression. Who's more important in the world than people who do that? The, the, the humanity of this uh, is what struck me. And the respect and dignity for the workers is what got me. So where did all of this art collection stuff come from? I can date it for you. This is the date. Um, and no doubt you can tell that the one of the hands on this newspaper is Vigo's because he was a best man, one of my three ushers uh, besides my brothers at my wedding. Uh, but we got married on the 14th after our sophomore year. Um, Lovis was a student at the Stella Elkins Tyler School of Fine Arts at Temple University, and you know where I was. Uh, and I went home after Dean Lippincott had given me his approval, and I had um, gone to book binders with Lois and given her a diamond ring and asked her to be my bride. Now, keep in mind, we had been going steady on and off since we were 13. So Lippincott had said to me, you're too young to get married. And I said, well, I've known this girl for six years. Um, but in any case, uh, this is the most pro profound day of my life, the most important day of my life. Uh, and Lois, as I told you, has, has really taught me everything uh, I know about art. Um, but it was also, in a sense, a melancholy day, because when I saw each of your faces come up on the screen as you joined the Zoom call, I realized that, you know, I went out to Pretty Brook Road when we got married. There's no student housing. Um, Pam Wetzel will attest to this. And um, I didn't have the eating club experience you guys might have had or the next two years uh, where I might have made more friendships than I did. I was lucky enough to have great uh, roommates in my sophomore year. We've lost Brian Bruel, but Brian Wright and Vigo, John Fisher, Bruce Smith. Uh, and, I, and I can't tell you uh, how important those relationships have become later on in life. And I, I suppose in a sense that when Lois and I got married, we both kind of agreed we might have waited till we were seniors or after our senior year. Uh, I might have made more friendships with you guys, uh, but so be it. Um, we, however, did not uh, simply collect art. We produced five children, um, Wendy uh, and Joanna and Michael and Robert in the back and Hillary, uh, and they've been very busy. We have 16, I think Gib might have said 15, but actually 16 grandchildren. Uh, and they all live nearby, and on uh, every pretty much every Sunday night, they are dining with us in that house. Lois makes the meal all by herself, uh, navigating through various diets of children and grandchildren, and I'm lucky enough to have them with us. So let's just talk about art again. I'll get back to this subject. This is the kind of art that hangs in our house, uh, works by people like uh, Jim Dine and Roy Lichtenstein and Stella and Mark Bradford, that's Lois looking at a giant Bradford we saw in New York last year, but ours are much, much smaller prints. Uh, Sam Francis, Jasper Johns, David Hockney, who has a sort of relationship to these 30s artists, which I'll get to later, and even Corn and Motherwell and so on. And, and so the walls are taken up, and frankly, I make this admission uh, without shame or embarrassment. I'm bored by this stuff. You heard what I just said about the bellows that I showed you. I could write a narrative for that. It, it stimulates me. And the, the narrative's up to me. I can change it anytime I want. I'm not getting a whole lot of messages from Jim Dine's saw. I'm sorry. He's a great artist and he's been extremely successful. And I would imagine that many of you have his work or know of his work, but it just doesn't do it for me. Uh, and so I started collecting on my own. Uh, but there is one piece in the house that I really still enjoy. Uh, this is a piece by Ed Roche. Uh, and Roche, of course, has now become quite renowned. To me, there are echoes of Hopper, uh, who does come out of the 30s. And as you'll hear from one of uh, my favorite artists, Martin Lewis, in this work. I'm a collector by nature. I don't know where that came from. I frankly have no idea. I started collecting first editions by Sinclair Lewis. Uh, who Dod, Dodsworth hooked me. Uh, then I expanded the collection of James Kane, whose Serenade is one of the great novellas of all time. 
uh, in my view. Uh, and then I've expanded it to Eric Ambler and Neville Shute and Robert Von Gulick and uh, as you can see, some others. But one of the things that caught my eye when I was collecting Sinclair Lewis was the fact that uh, in uh, Main Street, uh, the first editions club had its own edition of, uh, I think, 150 or 140 volumes of Main Street illustrated by Grant Wood. So I bought a, this first edition uh, from the limited editions club, which isn't really a first edition, but from their club it is. And I looked at the drawings by Grant Wood and I thought, these are spectacular. They bring the characters to life. If your mind is telling you when you read Lewis what these people look like, Grant Wood has nailed it. And if you saw the Grant Wood show at the Whitney a few years ago, you'll understand what I'm talking about. There's a guy from Ames, Iowa, who is a spectacular artist, maybe one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. So when I saw that and I visited my son, Michael, at UCSB in the 90s, I started collecting this art. And as I bought piece after piece after piece, I put them on the walls of my Thompson Coburn office across the street. And when our lease expired and we moved offices, the walls went away, the prints came down and they went into storage. The pandemic hit. My new office, which is behind me, has one wall. I'll talk about that later. And the prints framed and unframed sat uh, in our garage and under our bed. Uh, and then I thought, this is ridiculous. The kids have no interest in this. Lois has no interest in it. I could sell it off, but I actually think that the collection as a whole may be worth more than the individual parts. Not to me necessarily, but but to for further use, for future use, for educational purposes. So I convinced Lois without much difficulty to make this donation the university. Uh, I had a lot of difficulty with, with attracting interest from UCSB where I first saw this work, not UCSB, Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Um, but um, Princeton was very uh, happy to receive uh, this. Uh, Laura Giles from the university, the print curator was extremely helpful and guided me in some of the last uh, acquisitions uh, and I couldn't have worked with a better partner in making the donation. So, all right, all that's introductory. Let's get to what I really wanted to show you. This first piece, if I can find, get it to work. There we go. This is a remarkable wood uh, engraving by Bernard Russell Smith. His work may be known to you in another figure I'll show you later on, but he's done pieces related to jazz. This to me is a unique piece. I've given you the, the sense of what I like to do with this, which is to see some sort of story in it that resonates with me. My eye goes from left to right on this piece. And when it does, I go from 1910 to 1930, from a horse cor uh, drawn cart to uh, a classic 1930s cab. And along the way, the, the straw hat gives way to a fedora. These things are happening in it as you look at it. And to me, that'll keep me interested for a long time. Every time I see this impression, because it has such great contrast, I'm really happy to look at it and amused by it. Uh, Brussel Smith was um, so intent on getting his lines right. He used a sewing needle to make many of these lines. Now, in contrast, is a second piece I wanted to show you by Glenn Coleman. This is a little bit before the crash. Uh, Coney Island, everyone's out of their homes. It's certainly pre-screen time, right? No one's going to watch them to TV. I think maybe the first TV telecast was 28. But nevertheless, maybe it was later on, it was radio that, that was uh, drawing people to stay in their apartments. But here we have them outdoors uh, based upon their clothing. It's not summer, but it's uh, probably relatively mild outside. And if you take a close look at this, there's a riot going on. It, this isn't simply people out to enjoy the roller coaster. These people have clubs. They're hitting each other. A woman on the merry-go-round is pointing to a fracas. There's a police officer arresting a woman, a nicely dressed woman, and a guy in a bowler hat has his hand on someone's face. If you look at this, you can tell a hundred stories. And it gives you a sense of what was life, life like at that period of time. In contrast, this reminds me of some kind of bleary Sunday morning when you get up in New York City after you're a junior or senior at Princeton and you've visited friends in New York and you may have had one or two too many the night before and you can hear the slush on the on the the, the pavement and see the snow on the railings. This is an L, the Third Avenue L, no longer there, but 
uh, it, this is uh, the quietness of it. And I did want to draw one thing to your attention. In most of these works of art, you might say these are still lifes. But there's nothing still at all about these works of art. And the reason you see exhaust pipes here is to demonstrate to you there is movement. In addition to obviously the vehicles moving and as you're going to see in some of the other pieces, the humans are moving. Here's a piece by Howard Cook, a very famous artist of this era. You can see he's really captured what was going on in New York at the time. We're building skyscrapers. We are in the depression. These things that continue to go ahead. Uh, the government starts to prime the pump. America is building. And Cook has drawn this without distinctive lines. This is there's He's created shape with shadow. Keep in mind, these are not works directly done on paper. These are done on a metal plate, or they're done on a stone, or they're done on wood, and then printed. So to get this look is extremely difficult and challenging. And, and in this case, Cook is showing us a little village part of Manhattan at the bottom of the, the impression to the skyscrapers that are described in the New York Times article that I found. Now compare that to this, um, Graham Finley may react to this William McNulty piece. Uh, this piece is drawn by a guy who was a cartoonist at the Seattle Times uh, and well known for his gritty portrayal of, um, of workers during this period of time. But you're here getting a bird's eye view of Times Square. Um, and I, I like both of these, the, the Howard Cook sort of no distinctive line drawings as well as this piece. And you can imagine how much work goes into making uh, either a stone or a, a, a metal, a piece of metal create this and allow you to print it with this contrast. It's really remarkable. Now, when I said to you before that I wanted, uh, you might've noticed in the donation that we want this uh, collection to be used at least in part every year by the university for teaching. It occurred to me that I might, if I were teaching, I might take this Eichenberg uh, image on the left and use it as a teaching tool for a creative writing class. Ask yourself this, if you were teaching creative writing and you had 13 students in your class and you showed them this Eichenberg and you said to them, these are folks that live in a four story walk up in Manhattan in the midst of the depression. There's 13 of them plus the cats. Okay, I want each one of you to select a character and write a short story about that character, which ends at this point. Doesn't be the end of the story, doesn't have to be the end of the story, but at least for your purposes, for this creative writing experience, I want you to write for us what each of those, what your character, the one you choose, has done prior to getting to this particular moment in time. So that's sort of my idea. I'd like to see it used that way and maybe we create great writers like those that came out of the economic crucible of the 30s. Ernest Fine is another fellow whose works I've seen uh, at the from the very beginning. This is a much different scene. Madison Square Park happens to be around the corner from Swan, which is a, um, an auction house where I bought many of these prints, so it meant something to me, but it's a certainly more peaceful um, image than is the Eichenberg piece. All right, let me switch gears a little bit to architecture. As I mentioned to you, I've had the good fortune of meeting architects like Frank Geary and Cesar Pelli and um, Graves and Jan and, and Charles Moore and um, uh, John Jardy and Tom May uh, throughout the course of my life. I don't know them at all, but I can say that I've met them, talked to most of them a, a briefly, and I'm a groupie, um, you know, a Frank Lloyd Wright fan and all this stuff. So many of these pieces appeal to me because they capture the architecture of the 30s in New York when this is becoming the shining city on the hill. This is it. This is that city. It's being built in the 30s. And um, many of the artists are immigrants in love with New York. Uh, God love Bream, for example. You all remember going over the George Washington Bridge. Well, it was under construction in 1930. And this um, uh, Second Avenue L by Mark Freeman is a classic image of New York in this period of time. If you see compendia of work by artists during this period, in particular graphic artists, Mark Freeman, this image is typically shown. And then Lynn Thomas Morgan's piece is an entirely different approach. The dynamism you see in the other pieces, like the Freeman, and you can almost hear that train clattering over your head. The, the Morgan piece 
asks you what's happening in all those lights. It's dusk, who's there? And we've all seen this scene. Any of you have spent any time at all in Manhattan have seen this. So it appeals to me in a different way. It's quite different from the other pieces uh, and a bit later, uh, the Empire State Building being built during this period of time. Now, the next piece, these two uh, uh, joined together. They weren't together during rehearsal, so I'll keep Gib and, and the others awake by showing this. But um, the, the Earl Hoarder piece is not a great quality print, but Hoarder was an extremely prolific artist. He was a teacher at Lois's school, Tyler, uh, at Temple University for many years, retired in the late 50s. And I had him compared to Whistler because Whistler was also extremely prolific, did a lot of works that look a lot like Hoarder's work, uh, only he did it 65, 75 years earlier in London, although he was an American. Uh, and their works, I think, are quite similar, although they are depicting different images. When you think of architecture and building a city, you never really think about deconstruction, but deconstruction happened. And Hoarder has captured it here, maybe of a church. Uh, and in its place, maybe the Empire State Building went up. But you can see what Hoarder has done here. He's reminded us that construction, deconstruction has followed from the beginning of time. You can see Renaissance landscapes with Roman ruins in the background, and this is similar. On the right, you see what a work of art by Armin Landek, uh, a great WPA artist. A lot of these artists came out of the WPA, as you probably remember. The WPA actually employed 5,300 artists paid them the grant sum of $23.60 a week to do art art of any kind that they wanted without any censorship at all. Many of these guys were communist uh, lefties uh, of one sort or another. There was never any imposition on them as to what kind of art the government would pay them to produce. Landek uh, is very architectural as most I couldn't afford his most famous piece, which is called Pop's Tavern. The similar to this, very rectilinear. Uh, he's introduced uh, the, the rounded surfaces here to get a little bit away from that. And I asked Ron Landek a long time ago in an email whether or not this was a relative and Ron wasn't sure one way or the other. Um, he comes out of uh, Ohio too, uh, this Armin Landek does. So maybe there's a relationship. Okay, on to my interest in boxing. This, of course, is an era when Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling are going uh, at each other. They're lucky not to have met the guy in the lower left, uh, or is he lucky not to have met them? I don't know. But in any case, I do like boxing. I think it's great art. You see people like Manny Pacquiao fight. You can't help but admire the athleticism, the eye-hand coordination, the speed. Uh, and Robert Riggs was a big fan of, of boxing as well. Uh, and I have to say to you uh, that the John L. Sullivan portrayed uh, uh, in the earlier uh, Bellows print that I showed you uh, is quite different. There, uh, as you recall, uh, Sullivan was in the background. Here, Riggs has featured the boxer. He's got a, his right eye pummeled and his handlers are not giving him a manicure. They're telling him to get out there punching. This phrase, get up punching, is one that you'll hear me use again when I talk about Krispy Kreme. Um, and we'll get more into that. Uh, when we were freshmen, we got up to New York and used whatever ID we could to get a drink at an old bar. Maybe some of you went to McSorley's uh, in 1916. The famous, famous John Sloan did that. Uh, and um, almost 20 years later, Ellison Hoover did it. I love the Hoover work of art. And one of the things that drew my eye to this piece is that right hand of the big character in the center uh, on the bar. He's just made a, a point and the guy in the pipe is agreeing with him, obviously. Anyhow, I love this print. Uh, and it was interesting to me that two fine artists of the early 20th century both focused on this one bar, which, by the way, is still there and looks very much like the Hoover uh, looks in this image. Now, some of you know that I came out of the garment industry. My dad was in the garment industry. Uh, he had some tough times in it and had some good times in it. And I worked for him for a while. What's interesting about Grapper's piece is, keep in mind, this is the middle of the Depression. All of the men on those sewing machines would have otherwise been employed. But because it's the Depression, they are working on sewing machines. That is not my experience. I was in contracting shops after I graduated from Princeton and before. Um, women were manning the sewing uh, the sewing machines, not here. This is a different time and a different period. And another reason to talk about these 
images as teaching tools. Um, and you can see on the look of the floor boss here, he takes no nonsense. These are peace workers and they are generating as much uh, as they can in the way of work in order to get paid. And then on the right, you've got the incredibly sympathetic and compassionate artist, Raphael Sawyer. I'm gonna show you another piece of his, I'm a big fan. And there's a, a lady working as a seamstress. Now let's talk about the building of, uh, of Manhattan during this period of time briefly. Um, you can see Louis Lazowick, another Ukrainian immigrant, in this case, uh, a man of um, uh, left-leaning sympathies. Uh, he's, uh, his pieces are rebellious in a way, and I want to show you that later on. But you can see in the photograph what I wanted you to really focus on, and that is this masterpiece. This is by an artist whose work isn't that well known, and I'll tell you why in a second. But this is a masterpiece. This shows you two men working together without a tether. There's no safety harness here. And these guys are building a building that'll house architects and lawyers and dentists and uh, insurance salesmen. Whose work is more important? Aren't they all entitled to the same level of dignity and respect? In our hierarchical America, are they treated the same? Uh, to me, this speaks volumes. And I learned this lesson working with the people at Krispy Kreme more so than practicing law. I, I mean, this to me is an enormously heroic and important piece. He has another similar image done at about the same time. Uh, and he was published by the Associated Associated American Artist uh, Publishing House at that time. I think I have the name right. And he would try to sell these. Keep in mind, there's an economic issue here. These prints are selling for a small amount of money. You want to buy an original Samuel Margulies, you've got a, a, to be an enormously rich patron. But the print business freed artists from the yoke of patronage. They could go out and sell things like this. However, Associated said to him, we can't resell these to middle America. They aren't selling well. We want to see snow scenes. We want to see homey scenes. We want to see scenes that people want to have on their walls. People unlike me, because I want this on my wall. This, to me, is an incredible work. One of my favorite pieces of the 140 or 50 that we gave to the university. James Allen does the same thing. These people are glorified. This is the middle of the Depression. The fact that they are walking on these beams, notwithstanding having rappelled down the side of a hotel, I can tell you it's a scary thing. But what they're doing is the building of America during a depression. And, and this is a remarkable thing that they're doing and building a remarkable city. And here's a totally different uh, look at this. This is done by Brussels Smith again, the same guy I showed you in the first image that I uh, posted. And these guys are laying track. Uh, but look at their hands. Lois tells me it's very hard to draw hands well. Uh, look at this. You can see the hands on each one of them. As you could see it on the Ellison Hoover print that I showed you, that hand and the hand of the Michael Buffer-like announcer in the John L. Sullivan thing. Um, these guys are confident at what they're doing. You can see it in their faces. And I want to talk a little bit about how difficult it must have been during this period of time. And keep in mind, it's not just great art that came out of this period. All of, Many of our great novelists came out of this period, besides Sinclair Lewis. F. Scott Fitzgerald comes out of this period. Hemingway comes out of this period of time. Uh, you're talking about people in Britain like uh, George Orwell. Uh, I mean, this is a remarkable uh, uh, spouting of tremendously creative artwork. And when it comes to rebellion, it expresses itself in some of this work. Um, uh, the university's um, curator asked me about this Hugo Gellert piece, Hugo Gellert piece, and Gellert's becoming more and po more popular. Laura Giles had indicated to me that encouraged me to find a few more pieces by him, which I have. And Lazowick, again, the one I showed you who did the skyline of New York, is the artist who has done this piece. And this piece, of course, is it's easy not to look in the lower left-hand corner. Isn't that where you don't want to look? And he's showing you that the mannequins are impassive for a reason. They don't move. But the wife is moving into her purse. And the husband looks a little bit skeptical. Uh, but this is Lazowick telling us a great deal about what was going on, on in front of the Saks 
do they have any windows, uh, uh, especially during the winter? And let's go to the next piece. Okay, this is a continuation of the kind of reform movement. Raphael Sawyer, I told you, was an incredibly compassionate artist. And what's amazing about this piece on the left here, uh, besides the old man warming his hands, and you're looking at hands again, is that with two pinpoints, the eyes of this character, you can feel the compassion. That's great art. I don't know how you do that. And look at the, the pockets are stuffed. What do you think they're stuffed with? And then on the right, Reginald Marsh, a very famous artist from this period of time, is doing a similar scene that's a bit before the crash, but nevertheless, you can see there's hardship here. Uh, and yet community and moral community is something that I talk a lot about. When people help one another and create a moral community, uh, you create civilization with that. That's what our contract is. That contract with each of us. Now, there's a, three artists who I want to feature. Um, th this piece by um, Thomas Hart Benton, um, uh, this is about hay, uh, and it's the first piece that I bought. Um, the American regionalists did their own thing in their own way, uh, and um, Benton was the first artist who caught my eye and I've been a big fan of his ever since. Many of you know he's from Missouri. He's done uh, great murals and he's a very prolific printmaker. Grant Wood, as I mentioned to you earlier, is a remarkable Iowa artist. I, I love this quote from him and I, it's a theme that I want you to think about. Cities dominated culture, yet they were far less typically American than rural places whose power they usurped. That's a really interesting comment. And I, I was telling the fellows before we started, Finian O'Toole has written a, a, a book review in this Sunday's, last Sunday's New York Times uh, about peasants in Europe. And his comment, the, the comment by O'Toole is that peasantry as we knew it in Europe died in the middle of the 20th century. Here's Grant Wood, not quite in the middle of the 20th century, in the first third of it, and he is not showing a peasant. This is the king of his domain. This is a romantic image of the farmer, for sure, uh, not unlike the photograph of the farmer. I, I love wood, as you can probably tell. Now, I put these two images together for you to really look at closely, because uh, besides the economic issue, which I'll discuss briefly, there's an artistic uh, issue here. Dorothea Lange's photograph became the Madonna of the Depression. Um, Florence Owens Thompson, the migrant mother, that image on Life magazine and re published over and over and over again as a teaching tool, among other things, to, to remind us of what the Depression was like, is in her expression telling us a great deal with her right hand and her eyes. Look at Aaron. What is he telling us? To me, these are very powerful, put one against the other. And then as a backdrop, think about what it meant to be an artist in an era when photography became such impressive artwork. And did it threaten their livelihood? Uh, and how were they going to surpass what Dorothea Lange could do with a camera? I, I think there are a lot of issues that can be raised by the juxtaposition of these two. Bernard Spruance is, is a terrific artist of the period. His work got to be too expensive for me to buy. I love it. I got this piece. I was happy to get it. I'm not sure I understand why Macbeth, who's just learned that his wife is dead and maybe by suicide and is uh, getting ready for an attack by the Brits, um, why this is entitled that way, because the two vehicles aren't moving, but the humans are moving, the clouds are moving, the trees seem to be moving, everything's moving but the vehicles and the house. Uh, I don't know. I, his work is terrific. Get a chance to see it. Uh, you'll see football scenes by him, as a matter of fact. Motion is a large part of Speranza's work. Here's two more rural scenes that aren't quite what we imagine when we think about uh, rural America. The one on the left by Martin Lewis, my favorite artist, you'll hear more about in a second, uh, is actually in Connecticut. Uh, but you can see a Grantwood kind of field in front of the dark figure with the flashlight. 
the use of dark and light in printmaking is the big challenge. And this is handled absolutely beautifully by this artist. He is supposedly the teacher of Hopper when it came to lithography. This is an etching by him. Uh, and uh, I love this piece of work. Uh, I love the fact that he has put us in the center of this with a flashlight. On the right is a, a lady artist who, and I tried to co collect work by female artists uh, w whenever they became available. Uh, this is by the foremost, uh, uh, one of the most well-known woodcut uh, artists, um, Claire Layton. Um, she was a very, very um, brilliant woman, the daughter of two professors. Uh, this happens to be a lumberjack scene, but we would consider it to be part of rural America. And the last setting here, I put together these two images. This is all me, uh, but I, I, to me, these are the same characters. Um, John Stuart Curry is one of the most famous artists of this period. He's from Kansas. Remember that Wood is from Iowa, Benton from Missouri. Um, Curry did a great mural in Kansas, which was the subject of a lot of controversy because John Brown appears in it, who he considered to be a bloody maniac. Um, I had an image of Brown, but I've taken it out of this because it's distracting. This is an image of grandeur. This character that Curry has created in my mind, and he created it before 42. This was published in 42, but this art dates back into the Depression. This character is Heartland America. This is a romanticized view of it. There's a certain amount of strength and rebellion here. This is a, a, a man unhappy about the urbanization of the country, the centralization of manufacturing. Uh, and he's upholding standard values that made America great. And Superman comes out of this period of time. I don't think that's a coincidence. On to Martin Lewis. You see here uh, an Australian who came to the United States in about 1900, made his um, mark in commercial art and became a great printmaker. Uh, he, these, his works are etchings uh, and the image you see behind you is Chance Encounter. Uh, this image on the left of his Wet Saturday is fascinating to me because the 11 characters in this image are basically on one foot. Why are they on one foot? They want you to sense the motion in this. There's no such thing as a still light. These people are moving. You can feel that they're moving. That's the beauty of it. The only thing that's stationary is a mailbox. So I love the piece. The rain makes it even better. It reminds me a little bit of the turn of the century uh, Parisian uh, artists painting in the rain. Uh, uh, to me, it, it, it's a remarkable piece uh, of printmaking. On the right, again, this is a night scene. Lewis is known for his great night scenes. Um, and you can see those kids uh, aren't uh, too worried about having screens around. I got real lucky in my pursuit of art, uh, sometimes caught up in the chase more than the work, uh, but nevertheless got real lucky and was able to buy some drawings by Martin Lewis. These drawings bring Babbitt to life. Just as Grant Wood's work um, brought Main Street to life for me. These are the characters Fitzgerald wrote about. You can see them and I've got five of them. They're all quite different. Uh, and the university is lucky to have them in my opinion. And lastly, in this collection, Mabel Dwight, who has a great sense of humor and said about this piece that the two, the man on the right and the, the giant fish were hypnotized by each other. Uh, and for a moment in time, they were both frozen looking at one another, and then they went their separate ways. This is a great sense of humor. All the other characters kind of make me laugh, and I wanted to leave you with a smile on your face when it came to the collection. So that's it on the art. Make note of anything you want to come back to me on, and we'll go to the Holy Grail. Um, Krispy Kreme started in 1998. Um, to give you a little background on it, I had two immediate problems to solve. The first was Lois was all over me to get Wendy and her husband Roger and their new baby back from New York where they were working to LA. She has a giant magnet under the house and somehow they had foiled the magnetic field and it was my responsibility to get them to come back. Second thing is I developed a shopping center in Riverside with five other guys and we had some vacancies. So I thought, well, Roger's in the business of finding locations for Sony theaters and his territory is the Southeast. 
And I called him and I said, when you go on your trips to the Southeast looking for locations for Sony, if you see a concept not ubiquitous in Southern California, let's bring it to Riverside. You and Wendy can operate it and you'll bring Elliot with you and you'll relocate here. So I was trying to solve two problems at the same time. Third problem, which all of you have dealt with, is this might be a cool way to do some estate planning. I could create a company, a family partnership. So anyhow, I was trying to solve three problems at one time. Roger called me and said, Krispy Kreme wants to expand by franchising. Let's see if we can get the rights. In 1998, we signed an agreement with Krispy Kreme to develop 42 stores. Now, these are donut shops. It's all they sell us donuts and beverages. And they are supposed to do, according to the Uniform Franchise Offering Circular, which is um, acronymically not a good name, and Uniform Franchise Offering Circular. I can't see your faces, but there should be a laugh somewhere along the line. And um, we're supposed to develop 42 of these stores in seven years. There's a schedule attached to the back of the agreement, which says every six months you'll develop so many stores. And if you don't, you're in breach of the agreement. You could lose them all. You, you won't lose them for nothing. You'll lose them for fair market value, which is neither fair nor market. Now we're told that they're going to do a million and a half each uh, in sales based upon uh, the history of Krispy Kreme, which goes back to 1937. And I'd fallen in love with the concept. I've been to Chelsea in New York where their first franchise unit in this new round of franchising had occurred. And I thought it was fabulous. Nothing like it in Southern California. 1,300 independent donut shops, but no real chains. There was one here called Winchell's, which was falling apart, but otherwise no branded product. And I thought maybe it has legs. I, I'm not sure, but we'll get started. Then, so I signed this agreement, personally guaranteed the financial obligations uh, to Krispy Kreme to build 42 stores in seven years. We opened a first store in January the 26th uh, in La Habra, California, a town I've never been to before and barely been to since, uh, uh, well, I'll get to that, since 2006. Uh, and in our first week, actually six days, first six days, we do $141,000 in sales. Mind you, we're planning on doing a million and a half for the year. And the numbers keep going up. We go from 141,000 in six days to over $210,000 per week. By the end of the year, which is 11 months of sales, this little shop in La Habra, 2,400 square feet, has sold $9 million worth of donuts. It's 20 million donuts in a town of 60,000 people. In, in La Habra, people are advertising their homes as Krispy Kreme adjacent. The lines are 60 cars long. Police are calling me in the middle of the night to come down and break up fistfights because people are budding in line. People are paying 15 bucks to someone at the head of the line to buy a $5 box of donuts. Cash is coming in so rapidly, it exceeds the, the volume of our safe. And we have to send the general manager through the drive through as though he was picking up 12 dozen, 12 dozen in boxes, but the boxes are filled with currency so we can get it to the bank before we get bumped off. It was an amazing rush. I have, I have won a few jury trials in my life. I, I've never had an experience like this. I'm thinking to myself, I'm off of the hamster wheel. I don't have to bill an hour to have income generated by this machine making these fabulous donuts. It was an unbelievable rush. Krispy Kreme sent its executives out to see us. I would come home after, I would work as a lawyer until five, then I'd drive down to La Habra, I'd work until two in the morning, then I'd come home and Lois would go, what's that smell? You smell like donuts. And I'd say to her, get used to it, it's the smell of money. It was such a rush, Unbel unbelievable and I, I thought to myself, my God, we've hit the golden vein. Now, I know we weren't selling health food. I grant you that. However, in the second month of La Habra's being open, that little shop becomes the nation's number one retailer of single servings of milk. Now, how many times have you taken a child or grandchild to a restaurant when they order milk? I mean, Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola or whatever, but milk? Altadena parks a 40-foot refrigerated trailer in, a, in the parking field with an employee to do nothing but move milk to our display case because we can't get to it. There are so many people there. And I'm working in the Great Horseshoe. Uh, if you've been in a Krispy Kreme, you know it makes a kind of conveyor belt, makes a horseshoe, and the donuts go around it. I'm taking donuts off the line and putting them in a box. It's all a lawyer can do in a donut shop. And believe me, I could barely do it without leaving a fingerprint on the donuts. 
By the end of the year, we have generated $12 million in sales. Uh, EBITDA, that's earnings um, before other expenses, is a healthy 12.9%. But look at the bottom number on this slide, 500 employees. That is enough to make a sphincter quiver. That is enough to make me quit the practice of law. And in 2000, I had to go to work full time because 500 employees in Southern California, are you kidding me? That is something to tame, a tiger for sure. Anyhow, our success did not go unnoticed. First, it was noticed by our franchise or Krispy Kreme, symbolized by a heritage store you see here on the left. On the right is our Burbank store, one of the best Krispy Kremes on the planet to this very day. And you can see that we had built a parking field for the store, which is actually being used as a queuing line for the drive through That's what the demand was like. Uh, and the police would charge us extra because our queuing lines were coming out on main thoroughfares. And the press was following this. The Orange County Register sends an artist out to do a, queue, uh, a, a, a Rube Goldberg uh, drawing of the um, machine that makes our donuts. The Wall Street Journal is covering this. We're not on the business section, we're on the front page of some of these newspapers. And we are driving a public offering, which happens April 6, 2000. Krispy Kreme, the franchise, or goes public April 6, 2000, fueled by the heat coming out of Southern California. And we created that heat, thanks to my daughter, Wendy, in large part, by associating with great brands and by attracting attention from real personalities like Jay Leno, who mentions us in a monologue. In the year 2000, our sales, this is second year of business, mind you, are $34 million. And then I, I take a pause. My folks always said to me, and I'll bet your folks did the same to you, ask yourself why you're on the planet. An imponderable, I grant you that. But ask yourself why you're here. Do it every year. Assess where you stand. Now, I, you know, I was a pretty good lawyer and I'm thinking, you know, when things went well, was that why I'm on the planet? Am I on the planet to practice law and help my clients? And that didn't really resonate with me. And now we're selling $34 million in revenues, almost 100 million donuts, 75 anyhow. Am I on the planet to sell donuts? That didn't really resonate with me either. It was great, I, but it didn't answer the question my parents had asked me to answer every now and then. Fast forward to 2000, we can't find enough workers. The big box retailers are taking every worker in sight. So we do a program with the state of California at Valley College, which says to welfare workers, if you will attend two weeks, first learning how to get to work, keep your nails clean, how to take a bus, keep a calendar, say yes, no, please, thank you, those kinds of things. And the second week, we're going to teach you what a Krispy Kreme is all about. It's there to make a profit. And this is the way they make a profit. If you attend all 10 days of that class, you are automatically hired. So I go to the first graduation in my Krispy Kreme finest, wearing my non-skid shoes and my hat. And um, Vic Turner turns to me and hands me the diplomas, 15 diplomas. I'm looking at an audience of 75 people. And I turned to Vic and I said, Vic, you only give me 15 diplomas. Look at all these people. And he says to me, don't worry, there's only 15 graduates. Well, Vic, who are all these people? So he says to me, don't you realize what you're doing? Those 15 people you're hiring have uncles and aunts, children, and you're elevating all of them. That resonated. And then I got an answer. In 2001, our sales continue very nicely, 47 million, 1,200 employees, which is an awfully scary thing. And then in 2002, we can no longer harvest the low-hanging real estate fruit. We can't find locations, and I'm afraid we can't train enough employees. Keep this in mind. At the end of the year, we have 1,200 employees, but during the course of the year, we lose something like 70 to 80% of them below management level. So the actual hiring uh, is in the many thousands, not just 1,200 in the snapshot at the end of the year. This is a huge HR burden. We've outsourced it to Administaff at that time, a company called Administaff, which is a New York Stock Exchange company. We become their biggest customer west of the Mississippi. 
So this HR burden is an enormous one. I'm afraid we can't train people adequately and we can't find a real estate. So we go to Krispy Kreme and we ask them if we can slow down. Yes, we have a mandate in the agreement. We understand that. We promised you we'd build these stores, but we need to slow down or we're going to have poor locations and badly trained employees. You don't want that. We don't want that. Let's just slow down. We need to take a breather. And Krispy Kreme, as I said, went public April 6, 2000, two years earlier. And their CEO says to me, we've made promises to Wall Street and we intend to keep them. One of those promises is you'd build 42 stores in seven years. So you're going to keep that promise. And Roger, Roger my son-in-law, whispers to me, he's much smarter than me. He went to Wharton and he whispers in my ear, they're writing checks we have to cash. So I leave the room with a Rumpelstiltskin kind of stomp. And I'm sitting out there for an hour and the vice president of franchising says, calm down, calm down. And I said, we're the biggest customer you have. Everything in the store we buy from you, we pay more royalty than anybody else. How can you treat us like this? We're halfway home, 21 stores out of 42. Give us a break. We'll figure something out, he says. So they come back and they say, all right, if you will go into wholesale, sell donuts out of the back of your stores to supermarkets, we'll give you a year reprieve. 51 trucks later, 75 drivers, routing software, bakery executives, people driving Krispy Kreme trucks in Big Bear, getting shot at because they're so dangerous, and, and, and a driver on Sunset Boulevard running over and killing a pedestrian. We're in the wholesale business. 800 grocery stores. The Kroger out here called Ralph's, Albertsons, Stater Brothers. All over Southern California, a territory 350 miles long, 350 miles wide. We're driving donuts every morning. Donuts that were engineered to be consumed on premises. I mean, it's a disaster, a total and complete disaster. And my board, thanks to Grant Wood, one of the great artists, as I mentioned, says, sell, sell. You're completely misaligned with your franchisor. You've got to get out. And we try to get out. Krispy Kreme comes to us at the end of 2003 and says, okay, we'll buy you. You want to get out? We'll buy you. 2004 comes and we are, we at that point of 31 stores, we're doing 34, $64 million in revenue, 20 of it at wholesale to these 800 grocery stores who aren't paying us the way our regular customers pay us. We have to sue them. My brother, Mitch, a great lawyer, helped me do this. And we sued them to collect our money. Um, in 2004, when they had promised in 2003 they would buy us, they come and say, well, we're not going to be able to close. Let me give you a snapshot of where we are at this point. On the top line, you see the year. The second line is our revenue. The third line is the number of stores. The fourth line is earnings. The fifth line is the line you should really look at because that's long-term debt. And yours truly has guaranteed it personally. This is an amount far greater than my net worth. So on May 7th, the CEO of Krispy Kreme, who had been lauded by Fortune magazine two years earlier when Fortune magazine proclaimed it the hottest brand in America, is photographed with the caption glazed and confused, and the stock drops from at that point, $32 to below $2. And an announcement is made that the company is being investigated by the SEC, the DOJ, and the DOL. This is not a recipe for sales. It is something that is extremely frightening. Our sales are declining 20% week over week. We can't get out of leases. We can't fire people fast enough. And these are a 1,000 people we fire over the ensuing couple of years for no reason of their own. They didn't cause this. The, the reason that we got into trouble were all management decisions. Poor decisions of growing too fast, getting into wholesale, and many other decisions I don't have time to talk to you about. But I am telling you, it was management decisions. And yet, who paid the price for it? So in 2005, the whole system goes through a terrible, terrible hiccup. This is a disaster. And I get sued by Union Bank, Bank of America. Uh, I wasn't sued by GE at that point. Krispy Kreme sues us. We sue Krispy Kreme. It's a nightmare. 
Um, and, and thanks to Stephen Wright, I can look back and illustrate this with kind of a sense of humor, but believe me, um, depression is a very dangerous thing. You get suicidal. You can't get help. You feel isolated and alone. Uh, you can't even tell people around you how desperate you are. Uh, I, I mean, it was a terrible, terrible period of my life. Uh, and uh, the personal guarantees caused Lois to be drawn into this. And it, it revealed um, things about my character that I'm not too proud of. But in any case, this is what we're going through in 2005. After that glorious beginning, we hit a wall. And people would say to me, what are you so worried about? These investigations aren't read about by your customers. I said, oh yeah, well, they read the Denver Post. This is in the funny section. I don't think it's funny, but somebody did. My customers are reading that. If you wanna know where we were at this point, there it is. And what's misleading about this is we had no paddles. I didn't know how to get out of this. So the depression was really onerous and I don't take drugs or anything. So I had to sort of tough it out. Lois helped me. And then I remembered something my dad said to me, which I mentioned to you before, get up punching. He told me that it's not good enough that when you're in a hole to stop digging, because when you stop digging, you're still in the hole. You can't hire workout specialists to help you do this. You can't hire experts. You're the expert. Do something about it. And once that realization hit me, we did a whole bunch of things together as a team. 2006, I go to work at Steptoe and Johnson, uh, and I worked there for eight years, and then over here at Thompson Covert. Um, so the, the payroll, of course, is light. And Roger had to go to work elsewhere. Wendy and Brett Garlinghouse are running the business. And Krispy Kreme comes to us and says to us in 2007, if you will sell us the remaining stores, we will, you, will, you won't lose your house. You won't lose all that you've worked for all your life. You'll just lose everything you invested in Krispy Kreme, which is, for me, a fortune. But we would, and all of our investors would be wiped out. But at least Krispy Kreme, they said to us, would have, would maintain its foothold in Southern California, the most important market for us in the United States, because we were generating so much in the way of sales early on, anyhow. So we assigned an agreement with them in 2007. We filed for Chapter 11 protection. Now, the idea here was that this is in August. In November, they're going to close a deal, buy our stores, and I'm I won't lose my house. I'm working at a law firm, earning decent living. We'll start basically over. I mean, we got our house and our, our kids are in school or, or in this case, most of them are out of school. So we'll make it work. Then in 2000, in October, this is August of 2007, in October, Crispy calls and they say to me, the general counsel, Daryl Marsh, says to me, we can't close. We're not going to do the deal. You're on your own. Then when I came off of the ceiling, I said to him, you put us into bankruptcy and now you're telling me you're not going to close the deal? No, sorry, we, we don't have the money to do it. So I call Wendy and Brett, the two people who are running Krispy Kreme, and I said to them at, point, at that point, can you make this business work? And in a heartbeat, Wendy says to me, yes, I can make it work. Brett gets on the phone. Yeah, we can make it work. That was one of the second or third best days of my life after June 14th, 1964, and the birth of all of my kids and grandchildren. It was an amazing day. I never realized it at the time. At the time, I, I was at odds. I didn't know if this was going to work or not. So while we're in bankruptcy and, and in Doe I Trust, we put a plan together, put some fresh money in. All of our investors are wiped out. All of the investment loss and I had made before that hand is wiped out. But we start over fresh. I convinced the creditors by giving them this presentation I'm giving to you in much greater detail, NGE, to bear with us. They don't put us into a bankruptcy at all. They go along with the plan, and um, we come out of the plan, and Wendy and her husband Roger and Brett and I own the business, and it is alive today. It is doing extremely well. We love doing the business. Uh, our life is terrific. 
Um, my practice has done well and they're doing super at the business. And of course I learned this lesson that a lot of people learn. And that is, you know, oftentimes it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. So without going into any great detail, that's it. I've tried to keep it within the time frames that were allotted to me, but I have one other item I want to take up with you. And if you think I'm done, I'm not. I have a great idea for new business. I want you to get out your wallets. This is a chance to get in on the ground floor. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Ready? What do you think? Are you guys in? This is it. We can even electrify this thing, make it a hybrid. I don't care. It comes in every color. What do you think? And with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> Rich, sign me up. Sign me up. <laughs> thank you so much for it. An amazing in, uh, presentation on two very different dimensions of your life. My God, uh, we have a ton of questions and a ton, ton of comments. And uh, I'm going to start with the, uh, the the art ones. There's a lot of a lot of art questions and thoughts. Uh, let me just run the run the, uh, the the first one off would be Bob Chester. You're on, and we'd like to bring you on. And just feel free to just write your question and uh, answer your question directly of Rich. Uh, by the way, so anyone who has a question or comment, I've got a long list in front of me already, but uh, simply write your question into chat and we'll we'll kind of go from there. And behind Bob Chester would be Jeff Schaefer. So um, Bob, you're up and Jeff Schaefer, you're you're on deck. All right. So Rich, I had no idea <laughs> about what's been going on in your life. This has been really, I, I, I'm sorry to use this word, but I got to say it, it's been entertaining but it's very dramatic. Uh, first of all, look, I want you to please say hello to, to your lovely wife, Lois, for me. It's been many years. Uh, our friendship goes back way, way back. Um, my question about the about the art collection is this, because uh, my wife and I, my wife's an artist, we've acquired art over the years. My late wife and I did the same. Did you, how did you acquire these pieces? How did you find the pieces? Did you have a, a professional assistance in locating pieces that you that you had in mind you wanted, or did you come upon them at, you know, as you were perhaps looking in those places where you might find pieces uh, of your liking? I'm curious to know that, please. I, I worked with three uh, galleries um, in Swan. The three galleries are Catherine Burns in Oakland, or uh, Berkeley, and, and Nancy Ryan in New York, and the old print shop in DC. Uh, and they really, are three uh, very knowledgeable folks when it comes to this period. Uh, uh, and then Swan uh, frequently has print auctions because prints sell, you know, for under $10,000. And so there's a big market for it. And, and their auction books, Bob, are tutorials. They, they are fantastic. Even if you aren't participating in an auction, they're a great source of information. So those were my, my sources. Uh, I didn't have anyone helping me. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Jeff Schaefer, you're up. Yes, yeah, so it's a superb. And Dolph was next, by the way. I'll have to go down there. I hope they put it out on display in the new museum when they get it finished. Uh, but I loved the focus on New York. Uh, and uh, my wife, who was a docent at the Whitney for 25 years, was especially fond of Hopper. And I don't know if you saw the tremendous Hopper show they did about two years ago all your pictures kind of echoed what he was showing. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what's really special about New York to you. Well, my folks, from, my dad was from um, Brooklyn, my mom. No, my mom was from Brooklyn, my dad from the Bronx. So I come by it naturally. My grandfather came over from Russia and had nine bakeries in New York about 1900. So uh, I've got roots there. And like, you know, many of us, I would go up and uh, take the Port Authority bus and spend time freshman and sophomore year in New York. Then when I, you know, I made application to respond to the RFPs uh, to rebuild 42nd Street, I contemplated living in New York to do that project. So that part of it's special. And in addition to that, Jeff, I, it's so culturally rich. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, it's, it seems to me that it is still the shining city on the hill. Let's hope it stays that way. I, Rich, it looks to me like you've got some interesting art on your walls. 
Rich, there's, there's a lot of comments and just bravos and hand claps. So I won't, I, there's, we'll, we'll go back to those, but there's, they're not questions, they're, they're comments. But let's bring up Glenn Goltz with a question followed by Frank Nestle. Glenn, you're on. Good to, good to see you again, and, and thanks for doing the presentation. Congratulations on all the things that have happened to you since we saw each other last. I really appreciate your generosity to Princeton, your insights, and especially your passion for your collection. But I'm worried. I'm worried that if it goes to Princeton, you have somebody else present it each year, that it won't click in the way it just clicked to me. Many of us have seen some of these artists. Many of us may own some of these artists. But without your insights and without your the connections that you just made, I'm afraid to be just on the wall. Will you go back to Princeton and do an annual seminar? I accept your invitation, Glenn. If you were thank you, uh, <laughs> if you were running a museum and made that invitation, yeah, I'd accept that. I, I, and that's very sweet of you. I, I would love to do that. I am passionate about. It. Will they? Will they? Can you present it to them, and they will? Um, someone gets behind it. I, I sent the rehearsal tape, uh, which is a longer than this. I had cut out. What did I cut out, guys? Five or six slides easily. Um, mm -hmm. To Laura Giles, she's seen yeah. it. So the, the, the folks at the museum have seen this presentation, but I would, I would love to do that. Wouldn't that be great? It would be great. I'd love it. Thank you. Hey, Rick. Uh, Mike great Shannon. Idea. Very uh, soon. See you. Uh, great job. I appreciate it. And uh, as many of you know, Rick and I have something in common, and we're both married at Princeton. Frank, you're on. Uh, Rich, I so enjoyed that presentation, all of it. I've I've had my own challenges in business, and so uh, what you went through is like a, a uh, you know you know it's it it would make a great business case. So uh, I was so impressed with the uh, artwork uh, that both was about architecture, but also about the. Uh, the period and the night and the 1930s. Uh, and so I'm wondering, uh, juxtaposition your experience with working people in the Krispy Kreme business uh, and, and your obvious passion for, you know, people that work with their hands. Uh, how, how did you, uh, how, how do you how do you see the you know the workforce today from your own experience compared with what you were seeing depicted in in the 1930s? Mm. That's a really mm. interesting mm. question, yeah. Frank. There's a piece of my presentation that I talk about, um, which is intended for CEOs and such, to convince them that creating a moral community, one in which they value workers with every job description. Uh, and they they demonstrate that because I think it has to start at the top. Uh, and I try to convince them that if they create a moral community and they reduce turnover, right? We, we were hiring 70 to 80% more people in a year than we actually ended up with. That turnover cost is buried. Most accountants will not give you a bucket into which all those costs go. So I try to convince them that by treating their employees with dignity and respect, they'll reduce turnover and make more profits. So I'm appealing to the, the greed side, side of the equation. That's That was what stimulated my first part uh, answer to your question. The second thing is, I, I, I would say to you that um, the desperation of the 30s couldn't be further removed from what the workforce today feels. There is no sense of desperation at all. Uh, and there's a sense of entitlement that those folks you saw, saw in the girders would never have had. They would have been thankful for their jobs. They would have been working at sewing machines to prove themselves, take any work available, sell apples and pencils. I don't think you'd ever see that today. I really don't. Um, I don't know what's happened. I suppose if we, if all of us sat around for a couple of weeks, we could figure it out. But it's quite different from what I envisioned was there. And and yeah. the, you know, Frank, the hardest thing for me was to go to La Habra when we had to close it down, and it became, I think, a Chick Fil A. 
And all of those people who worked for us got fired. Not one of them was to blame. Well, but, um, you know, there is that entitlement. It's it's it, it's like we've built this, uh, you know, this economy that that uh, can't can't survive without pumping more money into into the system. And and uh, and that is sort of what what creates it. But thank you so much for your presentation. I'm sure other people have questions. Hey, thank you, Frank. And I'd like to bring on Rick Bowers to have a thought and a question, followed by John Hart. Hey, Rich. Great talk, man. Great. Um, so I oversaw the construction of an art museum in, in the Midwest, regional art museum. And so I'm really, uh, I'm very familiar with a lot of the Bentons and the, and the, uh, uh, the art that you, and woods and so forth. Um, and I also was a collector of art and I was perpetually looking for wall space and more places to show it. Um, I've now stopped. My question to you is, are you still acquiring? And if so, to what, to what end, to what purpose? I am not. And I'm not because we're in the fourth quarter and I, I'm joined the state council and I've got other things to do. If my kids had shown a real interest in it, I would continue. I see things that are being offered now. When Catherine Burns sent me a note saying that I had misdescribed one of the Martin Lewises, I saw her catalog and, oh man, she's got such beautiful things that I would love to acquire, but I'm done. I'm not acquiring any more first editions um, and I'm trying to get rid of my wine cellar. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, John Hart, you're up and followed by uh, uh, Lawson. John? Okay, well, Rich, thanks again. That was great. You asked us to pick <clears> up <throat> one and say something about it and ask for your comment. And probably my thoughts, right or wrong, are probably stimulated by what you said. So you were a great teacher, which reinforces the idea they better get you at the museum to lecture. But hey, I. Uh, jumped right in and picked out number two, James Allen, the pipe there, and a whole bunch of things. Well, first of all, this, the depth of field was unique, and then just the strength and concentration and precision of the workers trying to get that pipe, which I, and I could almost see the motion of it swinging, getting ready to swat one of them. And, uh, okay, they know why they're on the planet. That's a question for bringing water to the city. And uh, I got curious about the location. Maybe that's the Amtrak viaduct in the background. And, um, you know, yeah, John, it could be. Um, Alan did some very similar things in steel foundries in Brazil, but this is this is likely to be somewhere on the outskirts of New York. Yeah. Uh, and and what I thought was interesting about this is you only see the strap of the equipment holding that pipe. Mm. If you would were to see the machine, it might have detracted from what the the men were doing. So all you see is a strap holding it up. And I like that part of it a lot. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. And I saw some of the same things later on. The Allen's connector there had yeah. some of the same features. So yeah, oh, could have picked a number of them, but. I, I've got quite a few of the Allen's and I, I and <clears throat> each one of them uh, has sort of a different point of view, but very similar topics. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks for the comment. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Uh, Lawson, you're up, followed by John Holman. And Rich, it's great to see you. I want to talk about that uh, picture of you pulling out, leading very proudly, uh, a back who was too slow to keep up with you and got tackled in the backfield. If, if he had just kept up with you, he'd still be running. Two questions. The first one is, how do you account for that incredible praise of Krispy Kreme and the, that gave you your incredible start? And number two, uh, well, th that you're still standing is incredible. You've gone okay, through real challenges and proven yourself beyond all measure. Uh, but the next question is, you've been appointed to uh, uh, look at uh, fast food in California. And it looks to me like fast food is, uh, um, I don't know how they can continue if some changes aren't made and that will require legislation. And, wonder if you have any thoughts about how you'll meet that challenge, which may not be quite as big or quite as threatening to you personally as the Krispy Kreme one was. But again, bravo, bravo, bravo. You're the man. 
Lawson, thanks. Um, the answer about the craze of Krispy Kreme is um, if you want to build the platinum standard, or rather, if you want to build a valuable trademark, a really um, off balance sheet asset, you have to have the platinum standard product or service. There's no branded donut on the planet that is the equal to Krispy Kreme. Uh, and so the craze has at its core high quality, extremely expensive spring wheat, vanilla in the glaze. All of these things are very, very expensive. And the result is you have a first class product. So the simple answer, and it is facile to be honest, is have the best product and it accounts for the craze. In our case, there was a lot of pent up demand. People who had been to school in the South were in the service in the South. Magic Johnson, who would take the Lakers to the Atlanta Krispy Kreme. All of that pent up demand meant that we would blow the doors off the, the first year of our business. And it continued for quite a period of time until we hit a wall. So I, I would say to you, those are several of the factors. I'd like to think that we did a great job in creating the product the environment in which it was sold and in training people. And I think we did that in part because we trained people to look you in the eye and exchange names with you and try to establish a relationship with you above product or place so that you felt like going to Krispy Kreme was like going to In-N-Out. I don't know if you ever had that experience, but you you go to an In-N-Out, you order off of the menu, right? You, you go to the counter and you have the secret formula. You want animal style or protein style. And that's not on the menu and you're a cognoscenti. We try to do the same thing with the exchange of names and teaching people to look you in the eye and welcome you there. So you'd come back because you knew somebody there. So I, the, the craze itself, I think, starts with a great product and a, a time-honored brand, mismanaged over many periods of time, no doubt. Fast Food Council. As of Friday, I become an employee of the state of California as well as Thompson Coburn. So I have to be careful about giving you an answer. Mm. Uh, but I had breakfast with the regional director of the SEIU this week uh, or last week uh, in anticipation of our first meeting and immediately 500,000 people across employers industry-wide are targets for unionization. The effort is going to be that in an industry, they're going to unionize all these people at one time. My job I'm appointed to represent the franchisors, is going to be how can businessmen make ends meet? You can't pay people $20 an hour, and that means everyone who supervises them gets a raise, right? It has a vertical impact. You can't pay those kinds of wages and still deliver a lunch for under $10. How, how do you do that? The, the margin squeeze combined with interest rates being what they are, is is enormous. It's going to put a lot of people out of business. So there's got to be, as you point out, there's got to be some modification of this, or we're going to have institutional pressure, industry-wide pressures. I see it in healthcare, Lawson. I, I, I think the healthcare industry is ripe for the same sort of thing. It's it's going to be real interesting to see it way, the way it plays out. Thank you, Rich. Godspeed and be well. Thank you. Lawson, thank you for that. Uh, John Holman, you're up. Hi, Rich. Uh, great work. Um, so I see I went all the way to Princeton to uh, to uh, watch this. Uh, I, I have a mundane question about the art contribution. Uh, you know, when you give art, you get a tax deduction. Uh, and I, I'm not interested in the amounts here, obviously, but but you get a tax deduction. And often there's a debate with, with the receiving uh, institution as to what the amount of that deduction ought to be. I'm just curious about the process that you went through. So in order to qualify for a uh, charitable donation, you have to hire a certified appraiser. My appraiser was a professor, a fine arts professor uh, from Southern California, and she is required to value the collection at wholesale. Wholesale. Okay. Wholesale. So the university never questioned the value at all. There was never an issue at all. Good. Right? The only issues we had were the university wanted me to ship the 50 or so that were framed unframed. And I thought that was too difficult and a little risky. So I don't want to do that. But that was about it. The university was great. Laura Giles was terrific. And I hope the collection's in great hands now. I hope we can see it. Thank you. That, that's actually a great request. We should take that formally. We'd love to. 
find a way to see that as a class when we get back to campus. Let's make that a goal. I'd like to call on, uh, uh, let's see, Bob Chester again. Great question. Well, it is that question, Bob. You want to weigh in on that one? Sure. Uh, so, Rich, uh, I, that was the same question. I, I, I mean, I would like to see the whole collection, and I'd like to be able to see these pieces, you know, eyeball to 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 print. Is is there going to be an opportunity to do so at the at the university or elsewhere? Certainly not now. The university's new museum isn't open yet, so right now you'd have to go down in the bowels of the Dulles Library, which you may remember were fairly cluttered. So no, <laughs> you're not going to be able to see it. There's 150 approximately, including a large oil and, and um, uh, charcoal painting by John Chandler Christie. I, did, I, I didn't get a chance to show it to you, um, but it's a pretty neat piece of work as well. No, I, I don't think it'll ever be shown as a, in its entirety, John. But, uh, Bob, sorry. I'm sorry too. Uh, thank you, Bob, for that. And uh, we usually have a hard stop at 2.30, but there's a lot of questions. And, and I'd like to just actually ask Christine Leahy to weigh in. That would be a... I think a terrific question. Can you, uh, can we pull you up on the screen? Yeah, actually, this is yeah, this is uh, this is Bill Lay. This is Chris. Yeah, Bill. Yeah, okay. <laughs> fool me, Bill. She's, she's the IT lady. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much, Chris. It was actually excellent in so many different regards. You and Frank started down the road of questioning, you know, how we have changed, how our country has changed. Uh, my book group just finished a book by David Leonhardt called "Ours Was Ours Is Your Shining Future." which looks at the economic changes, the political changes over the last hundred years and kind of delves into the very questions you asked and gives a little bit of a question about the future. So for people who are interested in the workforce, what's happened in the past and where we go into the future, this would be a great book to read. He's written a number of books about the depression. Yeah. 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 And, and this is just about the last 75 years, basically, with politics, government involved, uh, investment by the government, no investment by the government, the changes in our society. It's 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 a fabulous uh, history of economics and policy and really kind of challenges us for the future, no question. And it's all right now. The big questions for the future are all right now. So thanks again. Excellent. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Bill. Chris, for the, thanks, for the computer. <laughs> and uh, Rich, thank you so very, very much from all of us. And I, there are others in the on, on the call today that uh, please feel, uh, Rich, you're open to emails, I take it. So that would be, would be great to follow up with that. What an outstanding presentation. Uh, <clears throat> with that, I will uh, I'll just, again, thank to Rich so very much and the team that made it possible, including especially led by Steve, uh, and just to let everybody else know that our next Tiger Talk will be Tuesday, April 9th, and we're going to hear from our classmate Ted Walworth with his talk, which is entitled, A Tiger Takes on the Second Amendment. So uh, if not sooner, we'll see you all then. Bye-bye, classmates. Thanks again, Rich. My pleasure.